Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Well, good morning, everybody. Y'all are the ones that are dedicated to the Lord. The smart ones are watching online. Hey, we're super glad that you're here. Two quick announcements that we want to share. Actually, maybe three. One pertains to today. If you signed up for Song of Solomon, hopefully you got your message yesterday that our time has been moved up to three. So we're going to start at three, go to five. Child care and all that still provided. You had to have already signed up for it. Okay, so that's that. Deeper that usually meets at 6 p.m. will not be meeting. Why are you here? Because you look nice. You're welcome. Uh, we're glad you're here. Our free grocery giveaway is still on for tomorrow. We're going to watch the weather. They have, a, they have a message system. You should already be a part of that system. Jimbo and Tracy said they'll let you know if anything changes. You ready to worship? Yes, sir. Yes, this guy sitting down front right here is Jimbo Warren. If you haven't signed up for the free grocery contact to help out with, if you'll see him, he'll make sure you know what's going on tomorrow. Amen? <laughs> wow. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> All right. Well, let's start, uh, let's start worship off praying together this morning. If y'all would stand. And uh, as we pray together as a church this morning, uh, first and foremost, we, we want to pray about this weather coming in. Um, and first, uh, I want to ask us right now to, to thank the Lord for, for a warm building to be in this morning. Uh, thank, thank the Lord for, for your home, uh, for, for a place to, to be out of this um, and to stay warm. And, you know, that's, that's only by God's grace. Um, and so we want to thank him for that. We want to pray for those who don't don't have a place to get out of this, don't have a home. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of folks around the world that are not able to, to have the things that we have. Um, and so we want to pray uh, for those who have to be in it. Um, we want to pray for, for all the infrastructure to hold up in these next couple of days. Pray for first responders and, and others who have to be out um, in the weather. To, to help take care of folks. And then um, as we're doing each week, kind of focusing on different aspects of, of the ministry here, um, this week I want to ask us to pray for our jail ministry. Uh, I want to ask us to pray for Marvin and those uh, who, who help him, who go into the jail, um, for God to use them uh, to bring the love of Christ to those men and women that are in there. And that God would, would use them um, through his spirit to open minds and hearts towards him. Pray that God would soften their hearts. That they would hear the gospel um, and respond to it. That the Lord would draw them to himself and transform them by his Holy Spirit. That God would continue to bless Marvin and the passion that he has to do ministry in the jail. And then for our service today, ask the Lord that he would remind us that we would remember that Jesus is our only hope in life and death. As we sing this morning, that that would be the theme of our hearts. And that as we sing the truth of the gospel this morning, that he would just overwhelm us with the knowledge of his grace and mercy. And that we as a church would, would worship him this morning with grateful and sincere hearts. Let me pray for us. Lord, we come this morning thankful for your many blessings, provision, just for your grace, mercy, and love poured out over our lives, God. This morning, God, we... We lift up these things to you as a church. We put them in your hands. 
God, as, as we sing this morning, as we open the word in every aspect of this service, Father, would you, uh, would you be glorified? Would you use this time to draw us to you, to stir our affections for Jesus and to worship you this morning? It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. sing together this morning. All my boast is in Jesus alone. What wonders, what wonders, what love is this? That Christ would die for me. His goodness, his merit, his righteousness. The sinner's only plea. All foolish pride.
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You rejoice in this even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which though perishable is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though not seeing him now, you believe in him and you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living. great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the god of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken I am forgiven, the King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my Lord. no claim on me the 
the soul sing it is well and stand secure from death to life we cling to this the hope of Christ the letting go the tears we cry, the silence left after goodbye, the lonely prayers, the longest nights, we hold to this, the hope of Christ. I lift my to where my help comes from my fire by night and my shelter in the storm until the dawn when your kingdom comes this my life the hope of Christ what takes the shame of yesterday what sets me free from past mistakes and when I fall yes I know I'll rise because of this the hope of Christ so I lift my Every lie will be undone, and every wrong will be made right. Oh, only this, the hope of. i 
Surround me with your glory, Lord. Forgive me when I seek after my own and remind me that I'm a new creation saved by your grace alone. I am prone to wander and taste forbidden fruits. I'm tempted by the long told lies. You can't be trusted and you aren't good. When I hear those whispers, oh, Christ reveals the truth. Surround me with your glory, Lord, forgive me when I seek after my own. in works and not in faith. But when I'm left tired and weary, in Christ alone I find my rest. Surround me with your glory, Lord, forgive me when I see my own and remind, remind me that I'm a new creation saved by your grace alone. Jesus, you are my righteousness, my strength. And my salvation, there's no one else, including myself, in which my hope shall rest upon. Jesus, you are my righteousness, my strength, and my 
sunshine There's no one else Including myself In which my hope shall rest upon I am prone to wonder Pursue the comfortable and safe Tempted to treasure what I lose With eternity at stake But when it's all Let's pray together. Father, we come this morning asking for that, that you would surround us with your glory this morning. God, that we would be overwhelmed with the fact that though we are prone to wander and constantly fail and fall, God, your love doesn't change. Your forgiveness is there. Your grace and mercy hold us. Father, we, uh, we rejoice in that this morning. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Y'all can have a seat. All right. Well, we are uh, in this sermon series, connecting and serving. And uh, as Greg said last week, each each of the pastors has taken a, a, a specific area or a specific topic to to preach on in this series. And so Greg gave me worship. Um. So I just feel like there should be a warning coming. Like, I have a hard enough time when it's just, like, a few verses that we're going to look at. Um, worship, best I can tell, is from cowhide to cowhide. So we're going to be here a minute, y'all. Uh, no. so specifically, this morning, we're going to look at two passages, in Coloss- one in Colossians, one in Ephesians. But before we get there, I want to go to Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 20. The title of this sermon is Worship, Some Assembly Required. We're going to talk about that this morning. What, when, when, I'm, when I'm talking about worship this morning, I'm specifically talking about the gathering of God's people, even more specifically, uh, the singing. Okay, Worship is obviously much more than just singing, but it's, it's not less. Um, but, but today, that's kind of where I want to focus is how do we connect and serve with the gathering on Sunday morning um, during worship. So in Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 20, it says this, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, 
His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God, nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being, and birds, and animals, and reptiles. Therefore... God gave them over in their sinful desires, their hearts, to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Let's pray together real quick. Father, we come this morning and just ask that your spirit would do the work of illumination in our hearts this morning and minds. God, would you... Reveal the truth. Would you use me, Father, as we look at this word together? God, would you encourage our hearts? God, would you draw us to you? It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. So what Romans 1, 20 through 25 tells us here is everyone worships. You're going to worship. It's a matter of what are you going to worship? Where is that worship going to be pointed? See, what he says here is that since the creation of the world, in, in other words, all of creation, he says, points us to God. All of creation, he says, man's without excuse because we can look around and see all that God has made and know that he's God. We can look around and know that there is a God when we look at creation. So we're without excuse, but what he also goes on to say is, but they traded the truth about God for a lie. They deceived themselves. And that's been, that's been the case since Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve looked <clears throat> at temptation. They looked at the fruit that they weren't supposed to eat, and they said, we don't trust what God says about himself. We want to be our own God. We don't want to be obedient. That, that's been the case for man for all of time. <clears throat> We trade the truth about God for a lie. And what I, what I want us to see as we look at Colossians and Ephesians is <clears throat> what that kind of looks like is, is, is that I think a lot of times we think idolatry. When we're talking about worshiping something other than God, we go Old Testament. And we think all of a sudden that idolatry is only the, the golden calf. As long as I'm not worshiping a, 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 a physical idol, then I'm okay. But what we see in Scripture is idolatry comes much easier than we think. We don't have to make some golden calf. We don't have to make some statue or image, as he's saying here, of animals and reptiles and different things to have a heart that is not worshiping the Lord and worshiping something else. We can be guilty of idolatry pretty easy. And we deceive ourselves uh, without even realizing it. So uh, if y'all want to turn there, In Colossians 3, starting in verse 1, I want to read, but as you're turning there, just an example of how easily we deceive ourselves. So last weekend, I finally talked Britt into letting me buy another horse. I wore her down. And so I go pick up this horse uh, down outside of El Campo, and... <clears throat> I, uh, I'm on my way back, get to Elgin, and the carrier bearing goes out on my truck, and the drive shaft falls out. And so, yeah, um, I'm sitting there, and do you know that you can't move a truck without a drive shaft in it? I mean, there's, it's just a rock at that point, okay? And I just, I told Britt, like, it's just so funny um, how I think I can be God of my life. And one little part goes out on my truck, and I'm completely helpless. But yet, I want to tell God how to do things, right? We we, we deceive ourselves so easily, and all it takes is one phone call, one little thing to to happen, and we're helpless, or it wrecks our day as it did mine. I I, I was not a happy kid after that. And yet, I think I can tell God how he needs to rule my life. Idolatry comes in uh, a lot of ways, but it comes pretty easily. Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. 
For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed. Listen to this. Which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, But Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Now flip over to Ephesians Chapter 4, starting in verse 29. He says this, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality, or of any kind of impurity, or of greed, because these are improper for God's people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient, Therefore, do not be partners with them. In both of these passages, which are very, very similar, Paul tells us that not only is there the worshiping of stuff, but there's the worship of self. And that's where many of us fall. What does he say? Don't don't have this lifestyle over here because you're buried. You've been buried in Christ. Christ has made you a new creation. Yet don't live like you used to. Why? Because people who do are worshiping self. We are are seeking our own pleasure above what God asks us to do. And in so doing, we are worshiping at the altar of ourselves. So let's talk about worship. Charles Spurgeon says this, Too many think lightly of sin and therefore think lightly of the Savior. He goes on to say, That it's the man who is guilty, who has the noose around his neck that's about to be executed, that weeps for joy when he hears the judge say, you're guilty, but today I pardon you. That's the man, he says, who weeps for joy. That's the one, when we we put in perspective um, how, how wretched we were as sinners, how wretched we are at times as sinners, when we put that in true perspective, it should recognize how how amazing Jesus is as a Savior. So let's talk about worship. Romans 12, 1 says, In view of God's mercies, we offer our bodies as living sacrifices to the Lord. All of life should be lived in worship. But as we talk about the gathering today, I want to talk about what worship is when I talk about Um, singing and and, and gathering together with God's people, what it is and what it's not. Over and over in Scripture, we're told, um, or a better way, we're commanded uh, to sing. God's people are commanded to sing and to praise and give thanks, making music to the Lord. Music is, is 
a gift from God used to glorify him. And it's uniquely powerful. I think we all understand that. Um, you can be moved by music whether you're a musician or not, right? <clears throat> it's uniquely powerful. We see, uh, I just finished reading 1 Samuel, and the, uh, the Lord says sends an evil spirit on Saul, and he's tormented. And his advisors come to him and say, hey, the only thing we can come up with that could help you is I think you should listen to worship music. And so they are, we, we know this shepherd kid that, that plays a mean harp. Um, and we're going to bring him in. And every time that the, the spirit tormented Saul and he was angry and, and crazy, David would start playing worship music and Saul would calm down. Music is powerful. And it has both vertical and horizontal connections when we gather with God's people and sing worship to him. What it's not is it's not about a particular style or, or a uh, a particular preference or style is, doesn't make worship more authentic or not. I remember a, a story I was told one time about this instrument that, that the, a church brought in. It's been a few years back. Um, and um, the, the pastor said, we're going to start having music in church. We're going we're to have this instrument that we're going to start worshiping with. And the people went nuts. They said, this, this cannot come into the church. We are not going to have this instrument that's been played in bars up until this point, And now you're going to bring it into the church house. They literally, in the middle of church, take the instrument, go out back, and throw it in the river. You know what that was? It was a piano. I said, it's been a few years ago. <clears throat> But it's not about a style, okay? It's, it's not about a certain um, musical style that makes worship, worship more uh, authentic or not. It's not a performance. When, when, uh, when the band leads, we're, we're, we're the choir director and y'all's the choir, okay? We're not putting on a performance. I told somebody this week, we were talking about worship, and I said, what we are not up here is a, a mediocre Christian cover band, Okay? <laughs> We are, we are leading God's people, worshiping together. And too often, I think, we come into the, to, to worship and, and we see the lights and, 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 and we're playing, um, I don't, I don't want to pat myself on, but we're playing good music, you know, like, <laughs> and, and, and there's this temptation to, 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 to see it as a performance, or even worse, to see it as like American Idol. Where, where we're the performers, y'all are the judges, and then you walk out of church going, I don't know, I tried to worship today, but the guitar was out of tune, and drums were loud, and be honest, Rob was a little pitchy. <laughs> That's not worship, right? It's, it's the people of God coming together, giving glory to Him. It's not a performance. It's not a concert, but with this in mind, I think uh, I grew up... Uh, in a small Baptist church where we had the piano and the, and the organ, and anything outside of that was the devil, okay? So we didn't, we didn't, you, weren't, you didn't bring instruments in other than the piano and the organ. And I, I say all that because I remember growing up, like, so we would go to camp. You have this, this crazy loud band that was just awesome, right? And then we'd come back to church and be like, but that's the devil? Like, can we have some drums? Can we, you know? And back then it was like, there was this, they called them worship wars, right? It was like, what's better, hymns or praise songs? What, you know, what's more biblical? All this stuff. And uh, you heard a lot, well, it's not a concert. We don't, we don't need all this because it's not a concert. And I think what we miss is everybody worships. And I think God has put it in our heart. If you go to a concert, what's happening? Music's being played. People are gathering together, focusing together, singing songs together. God put that in us. That's not the devil. Okay? And so what, what I'm getting at is, though this is not a concert, um, when you look at what heaven looks like in Revelation, when we, when we went there and did that Bible study, or when I preached the series on Revelation, heaven's loud, and it's bright, and there's a lot going on. Worship in heaven is colorful, yet Jesus is still the sinner. He's still... The one that worship is centered on. Revelation 4 talks about a rainbow surrounded throne and there's somebody seated on it. 
Flashes of lightning, peals of thunder, fiery torches, voices like trumpets. Revelation 7 says every tribe, nation, people, and tongue standing before the throne, they're crying out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. Worship in heaven is loud, it's bright, it's colorful. Another thing that this is not is it's, it's not the warm-up to the main event. But everything that happens from the opening prayer to when we say simply Jesus and walk out the door, everything should be for God's glory and his worship among the people. And finally, it's not about us. You look at what worship looks like in heaven and it's throne focused. And there's somebody on the throne and it's not you. Our worship is pointed to the throne. It's pointed to Jesus. H.B. Charles says this, God is the subject and object of our worship. It is for God and it is about God. Francis Chan said this one day, he heard a person as they were leaving church said, I didn't really enjoy worship today. And he said, that's okay, because we weren't worshiping you. (laughs) Worship must be God-centered, not man-centered, or it's not biblical worship. So go back to Colossians chapter 3 and look at verse 15. Three fifteen says this, Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another. How? With all wisdom, through psalms hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Singing to God with gratitude in your hearts, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. We need one another. Ephesians 5 says something very similar. In Ephesians 5, 15, it says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We need one another. But he says in both of these passages that we learn from one another, that we encourage one another, that we grow in wisdom, in understanding the message of Christ. All of this is done, he says, when we sing. When we sing the truth as the people of God, we're sharing the truth with one another. We are growing in wisdom. <clears throat> we use singing in church, he says, to, to teach, to admonish, and share the message of Christ and the wisdom of God with one another. In Ephesians 5.18, he says, to be filled with the Spirit, not wine. Now, why does Paul say that? Why is he picking on the ones who want to drink wine? I mean, he just listed all these other sins Why does he go to that one? He does it for a couple of reasons. One is the context that he's writing it in. In in Ephesus, where this church is, pagan worship um, involved getting drunk. So they would go to the temple uh, of whatever god, and that's that's how they would worship, is they they would just get so drunk that their mind was so altered that they thought that they were experiencing the Lord. Okay? Uh, If you've ever seen Young Guns, this is the only way I know how to put this together. If you remember, in Young Guns, Chavez y Chavez gives the gang some some stuff to help them get to the spirit world. All right, That's what's taking place here. And so what Paul is saying is, don't worship like pagans. Be filled with the spirit. You don't need something to get you to God other than his spirit. In Psalm 73, talking about we need one another. It's over and over in the, in the New Testament, uh, we're told to one another one another in different ways. Encourage one another. Lift up one another. Pray for one another. 
the people of God, we need one another. It's there in Scripture. In Psalm 73, y'all don't have to turn there. I'm just going to hit it real quick. Asaph says this. He says, God is indeed good to Israel, to the pure in heart. But as for me, my feet almost slipped. My steps nearly went astray. For I envied the arrogant. I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have an easy time until they die and their bodies are well fed. They're not in trouble like others. They're not afflicted like most people. And then he goes on to say, look at them, the wicked. They're always at ease. They increase their wealth. Did I purify my heart and wash my hands in innocence for nothing? For I'm afflicted all day long and punished every morning. If I had decided to say these things aloud, I would have betrayed your people. When I tried to understand all this, it seemed hopeless until I entered God's sanctuary. Then I understood their destiny. He says it's in the entering of God's sanctuary that that. Though he looks around at the world, I don't know if any of y'all can relate to him, but looks around at the world and says, God, why? Why do the wicked have it so easy? And here I am, he says, have I washed my hands in vain? Have I worshipped you in vain? Because all I get is punishment and affliction. He says, I almost believe that lie until I enter the sanctuary of God. In the New Testament, it puts it this way. When we get together with God's people, we receive all wisdom. We receive and understand God's will. He says, I understood what their destiny was once I came to worship. He literally does what Paul tells us to do in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. The psalmist literally has to set his heart on things above, set his heart where Christ is seated. He pictures heaven and he puts this 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 world and all its all its craziness up against the picture of heaven, and he goes, You know what? It's not that big a deal. I understand now because I've set my heart and my mind on things above, not on earthly things. He said he did it by worship, entering the sanctuary. We gather together, teaching, admonishing, encouraging, and submitting to one another in Christ through singing to remind us of the truth, the hope that we have in Christ alone, but also to knock off the deceptions of the world. We gather together and sing the truth to help one another believe it on the hard weeks when we don't wanna we don't wanna face life, when we have a hard time singing. That's why we need this gathering. That's why we need to sing together because people need to hear your voice because there's some folks in here who whose heart is hurting and they don't know how to sing right now. But when they hear the people of God singing the truth and hope of God over them, God does something in that. So people say, but I can worship alone. I can, I, can go out, I can go out in the woods. I can do whatever. I can worship alone. Yes, and you should. Jesus gave us that example. He would go off alone and pray. He would go off and spend time with the Father alone. But listen, private worship time is important. Time alone with Jesus is essential. It's just not enough. We are called to, to gather with the people of God to encourage one another and to worship God together. So why do we sing? One, it's commanded. He tells us here we sing to be filled by the Spirit. Matt Carter says this of this passage. He says, one of the most biblical answers to the question, why do we sing in church, is worship through singing helps you and I be filled up with the Holy Spirit of God so that we can walk in the power and presence of God when we leave here. It fills us up. Why do we sing? To teach and encourage one another. We do it to gain wisdom. We do it to connect our doctrine and our theology with our hearts, with our affections and emotions. If I said next week, instead of music, I'm just going to give a talk on the substitutionary atonement of Christ. Probably going to be a down Sunday. Right? But when we come together and we sing over and over that truth, that Christ took my place, that he took my punishment, and that he died a death that I deserved, and then went to the grave and walked out of there on the third day, proving that it worked, proving that I have a living hope that we just sang about, that does something. It connects our theology with our hearts, and hopefully it causes us to overflow in worship, singing with our hearts to the Lord. It gives words to our prayers when we can't, when it's tough, when I don't know what to pray. I sing, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. 
the song we sing that Jesus, you are enough. With nothing, I still have everything because you are enough. We sing to give words to our prayers when we can't. And finally, why do we sing? Because Jesus did. We, 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 we don't typically focus on it, but what does Jesus do after the Last Supper? In Mark chapter 14, he says this, Truly I tell you, I will no longer drink the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it, new in the kingdom of God. And listen, after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, All of you will fall away because it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Going into Jesus' hardest moment in his life, he knows what's coming, and yet what does he say I want to do right now? I want to sing a hymn with my boys. We need one another. We need to sing together. What do we sing? We're told to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. In a specific way, we sing to God and about God. We sing songs that are rooted in the Bible, in the gospel, and songs that are focused on God, on the throne, not on man. And that includes songs of joy, songs of lament. They both honor Jesus' songs from God's past works, and in, we're also told in Scripture to sing a new song. That doesn't necessarily mean like God's gotten tired of what we've been singing and I need something fresh. But in the Old Testament, what that meant was the people of God, before they went out to battle, they would gather and they would remind themselves, hey, he brought us through the Red Sea. Hey, he brought us through the wilderness. Hey, he helped us defeat this enemy and that enemy. And so then the new song would be, and guess what he's going to do next? He's going to rescue us from that enemy. It's a song of victory, just like we just sang, Jesus, yours is the victory. We sing songs today. Our new song is that we have the victory already won. We sing from a place of victory right now because of Christ. And finally, how do we sing? Scripture says we sing, over and over it says, with a grateful heart. We sing out of thanks. These passages both talk about singing with a grateful heart, giving thanks to the Lord. How do we sing? We sing in spirit and truth. Jesus tells the woman at the well that the, uh, there's a time coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. He says the Father seeks those kind of people. The Father seeks such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Tony Evans puts it this way. God is on the hunt for those who will worship him spiritually through Jesus Christ based on the truth of his word. There are parameters to worship. We're told to worship in spirit and in the truth of God's word. And then finally, Ephesians 19 through 21. I want to read that again. And I'm sorry, Ephesians 5. Verses 19 through 21. He says this, Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymn, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Giving glory to God and giving thanks to the Lord is what we're doing in worship. And it's not about our voices, but it's about our heart. He says you do it from your heart. Deuteronomy 6, what are we told? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart. God desires our heart. Jesus, on worship, says this to the religious leaders. He says, you hypocrites. The prophet Isaiah was right about y'all when he said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. It's not just about the music. It's most importantly about your heart. John Piper says God is most glorified in us. He receives the most worship from us when we are most satisfied in him. It's when he has our heart. It's not just your voice that you worship him with. It's your heart. The voice is just doing what God created it to do. All of creation, we're told again in Romans, worships God. The Bible tells us the trees clap their hands and the rocks will cry out. The voice is just doing what God created it to do. See, you can be an unbeliever and you can sing these words. It's when the heart's connected that worship happens. Lots of unbelievers just spent the whole Christmas season singing songs about Jesus. There were songs about the Lord all over the place. In stores, you don't normally hear church songs in there, but they're playing Silent Night and Away in a Manger, talking about Jesus. Lots of people can sing 
the words. It's about the heart being connected. He says this in Colossians 3, singing to God, giving thanks to God through Jesus. And here in 5, chapter 5 of Ephesians, he says, sing and make music to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father. He says, for everything in the name of Jesus. We're singing to someone. That Savior on the throne. Our Savior in whom we have found satisfaction for our souls, we're singing to Him. Our Savior in whom we found peace for our sufferings, we are singing to Him. The one who gives hope for our hearts and in whom we've received pardon from wrath. That's what stirs our hearts to rejoice in song, is our focus and love for Jesus. What we see, and going back to Revelation, is that worship in heaven is not taking place one day down the road. It's taking place right now. That right now the throne room of heaven is filled with the praises of God's people to, to, to Jesus. And so we have a unique opportunity when we gather with God's people. I apologize, I'm losing my voice. We, we have this opportunity as we gather with, with God's people in a, in a, in a moment we're doing the same thing that's happening in heaven. We are, we are gathering and joining with heaven in the worship of our Savior. Um, one, one thing that Britt and I have talked about is, you know, with, with my cancer stuff, and if God doesn't choose to heal me, and he chooses to take me, there's one moment where we will still be connected. And it's that moment where she's standing over here raising her hand, singing to Jesus, and I'm doing the same thing in his presence. Worship is important. We need one another. Singing is important. And we get to join in what we're going to do for all eternity. With God's people, singing praises to our Savior. So I'll wrap up with this. We can't one another one another without one another. It's just true. We can't one another one another without one another. See, um, I don't know how, what version of the Bible you've got, but here in the NIV, there's a break in the chapter. Now, when Paul wrote the letter, he didn't break the letter and say, here's instructions for Christian households. Okay, it was just a letter. In the CSB that I use for, for my quiet time at home, the break happens after 21. But what, what, what I want us to see here is uh, we immediately break that and we go, okay, this ends Paul's talk on worship and now we're going to talk about submitting in the home. That's not what happens here. He says, this is what we're doing. We're singing songs. We're, we're singing hymns. We're one anothering one another. And then he says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's tied to worship. We submit to one another in worship. We lay down our pride and insecurity out of love for Christ and love for his people. And we sing praise to Jesus and let the gospel message dwell, it says, richly among us through the songs that we sing so that God may be glorified. And we sing with one another. We submit to one another. How? Because, you know what? I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm making an example. I was going to say, I, I'm not a big singer. I kind of am. But. When we sit here and say, I'm not a good singer, I'm not, I'm not big on emotions, I'm not big on, 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 on singing, Jesus would say, or Paul would say, submit. Get over your pride. Get over your insecurities, which is just pride on another side of the spectrum. And sing, because we need you to sing. As the people of God, we sing with one another and we sing for one another. We worship the Lord with one another. It says we let the gospel message dwell richly among us when we sing. I was trying to think of an example of, of, of an analogy of how that works. And uh, y'all may remember I mentioned George the show pig the last time I preached. The dude's just a wealth of sermon illustrations. Um, so I go out this morning and, and me and Ryder spent yesterday... Um, getting everybody ready for the for the storm right and so we go out this morning and george is tucked in the hay underneath the uh the heat lamps and uh dirt bag our barn cat um <laughs> we uh we don't do like fluffy names um 
So Dirtbag, our barn cat, is balled up on top of George, like on his back and right underneath the heat lamp. And I was driving to church and just laughing about that and just had this thought, like, what does it look like to let the word of God dwell richly among us as we gather with the people of God, singing to the people of God? It's like old dirt bag, okay? <clears throat> Not only did he have the heat lamp from above, but he's using George's warmth from underneath, okay? When we gather as the people of God, that's what it means to let the word dwell richly among you. There's a horizontal connection here. There's a vertical connection there. We're, we're under the lamp and we're getting the warmth from the pig when we worship. If you leave here today and say, Rob called the church a fat pig, I'm not going to deny it, but that's not exactly what I meant. But we need one another when we worship the Lord. I want to end with this quote. We do not gather because the church leaders instruct us to. We do not gather because this is what we traditionally do on Sundays. We do not gather because we feel like going to church this weekend. Psalm 106 says, Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. For His steadfast love endures forever. We gather because the Word of God calls us to worship. It's not a worship experience. It's a worship service. We serve God in worship, not the other way around. And we serve one another when we worship Jesus together. When we come together, we worship Jesus, and we encourage one another to do the same. <clears throat> so this morning, like I said, you can be an unbeliever and you can sing these songs. You can be sitting here today and enjoy the music, but it's, it's where your heart is. If you've never allowed Jesus and his pardon, his blood to cover your sin, you're just singing words. You're not connecting with the Savior. The gospel message is, what's the message of Christianity? It says we, we, we give the message of Christ to one another as we sing. It's that we're rejoicing in the fact that though we were sinners, Christ died for us. That he went to the cross, he died that death that I deserved. He paid for my sins, and when he walked out of that grave, it proved that God accepted the payment for me. And he'll do the same for you. You don't have to understand it all. You just got to say, Lord, I don't get it all. But I believe that when you went to the cross and when you walked out of that grave, you paid for me. And I want to worship you for the rest of my life. Let's stand together. And the band's going to come up and I'm going to pray. The pastor's going to be down front. and Maybe, maybe you just need, need some prayer this morning. They're down here to do that. Maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's time God's calling you to do something. And you need prayer for that. Whatever it is, let's use this time to worship the Lord. Let me pray for us. Father God, we come as your people gathering together, Father, to encourage one another in this walk. But God, all of this is for your glory. And so God, we give thanks this morning for your love, for your grace, for your mercy. God, you are truly worthy and are the only one worthy of our worship. Forgive us, Father, where we look to other things to bring satisfaction in our lives, God. And may we just truly honor you with all of our hearts. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Sometimes I fall to my knees and pray. Come, Jesus, come. Let the day be the day. Sometimes I feel. Like I'm gonna break, but I'm holding on to a hope that won't fade. 
So come, Jesus, come. We've been waiting so long for the day you return to heal every hurt and right every wrong. We need. Turn this around well, Deep down I know This world isn't home So come Jesus, come Come Jesus, come There'll be no war There'll be no chains when Jesus comes. Let today be the day He'll come for the weak and the strong just the same. So come, Jesus, come. We've been waiting so long for the day you return to heal every hurt and right every wrong. We need Turn this around Cause deep down I know This world isn't home So come Jesus, come Come Jesus, come One day he'll come And we'll stand face to face. Come and lay it all down. Cause it might be the day. The time is right now. There's no need to wait. Your past will be washed by the rivers of grace. So come, Jesus, come. We've been waiting so long for the day. Deep down I know this world isn't home, so come Jesus, come, come Jesus, come.
Well, when you're the lead pastor, you make sure you line up the preaching the way it should go. So I'm glad I preached before Rob. <laughs> and be praying for the other pastors this month. Uh, I hope that you really grasp what Rob has shared with us from his heart about worship. He has led us phenomenally for years to draw closer to the throne. And the band has done that. And this is an opportunity to really worship. I had the honor to be before a lot of other churches yesterday represented and uh, several people that have been to our church and have heard our band have said, can we have them? And of course, the answer is always no. Uh, in the cowboy church, uh, band is a big deal. And for whatever reason, God saw fit to bless this ministry abundantly with the leadership that he has for years and years. And we're so excited and so grateful and thankful that not only does he help lead us, he teaches us. And uh, I just, it spoke to my heart. And I don't often get to be here to hear Rob preach live. I'm usually watching on screen somewhere around the world that Casey has made me go. <laughs> Real quick, we passed out the budget uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it is amazing that our budget is $665,000 plus dollars. Uh, a year to do what God has called and equipped us to do from homeschool co-ops to PDO to cow kids to worship to missions to arena and everything in between. And our prayer is that you had an opportunity to call and talk to the stewardship team if you have questions. Uh, and I would just like to encourage you with a hearty amen that you are looking forward to seeing what God's going to do in the future at Top Ten. If you are not in favor of that, would you please see me immediately after church so we can talk? Uh, we're excited. God is doing amazing things in this place. I'm just blown away that y'all came out today in this cold weather. Be in prayer as Rob led us in guided prayer for the first responders and all the people that have to be out in it over the coming days. Uh, Song of Solomon, people. Nursery will be open at 245 to drop off your precious ones, and we will start at 3. Looking forward to seeing you then. Amen? Let's sing. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so.